really excited and happy to have been invited to talk to you today about uh, this project, Resiliency Village. And if this is all being recorded, I'm taking Catherine's introduction with me from now on. <laughs> Genius, that's, wow, that's the first, that's a first ever. So <laughs> thank you so much uh, for that. And just as a little bit of background in all of that stuff that Catherine talked about, uh, I came to be really appreciative of people who are working in uh, trauma-informed care sort of manner after becoming a foster parent myself, after years of working with foster kids and foster families and homeless kids, and really seeing what the impact of trauma is when it comes to your home. So I, I, after that, I, I realized that trauma is really at the root of a lot of people's um, issues, no matter what they are, no matter where you are on that uh, continuum, whether you're a kid in school, just getting started, or you're years and years down the road trying to figure out why you feel certain ways about certain things. So I'll have Eli get my presentation up here and we'll, we'll just jump right into it with the screen sharing. Okay, and there we are. So Resiliency Village, and you can see that our little tagline to the logo is housing, healing, and hope. And we're going to be taking a look at the connection between trauma and homelessness and this approach to that issue. So Resiliency Village has a pretty simple mission just to provide housing, healing, and hope to those who are homeless in an inclusive micro community. Um, I'm sure you can all read, so I don't have to reread these things for you. But the idea of approaching it as um, a community project where if we don't have the support of the multiple levels of government from city, county, state, we have to have other uh, service providers involved. We have to be working with the schools. We have to be working with the nonprofits. We have to be working with faith-based and the business community. So that it takes all of us to make a, a mission like this and a vision like this to happen. And so we realize that if this isn't done with a whole bunch of people, it probably isn't going to get done. And what I've learned in this kind of work and in coaching, I spent a lot of years coaching basketball and, and track is that what we focus on changes, what we put our emphasis on changes. And until we make this a point of emphasis, it's going to be just like it is and probably continue to get worse. But when we focus on something, I mean, we can put someone on the moon, we can get on top of a crisis like AIDS. There's all kinds of examples of something that seemed absolutely out of control and impossible to deal with that once our focus was brought to it, we can make those changes. So if you've been paying attention today, you probably are well aware of trauma and I do this presentation or various uh, versions of it in many places. So I always wanna make sure that we're all on the same page or close to the same page when we talk about what we mean by, by trauma. Uh, I like this definition as good as any, and it's got, got a source at the bottom if you wanna check it out, but um, an event or a series of events or circumstances that, that are really physically or emotionally harmful, life-threatening. If we don't deal with those, they have profound effects on us for the rest of our lives. And if you saw this morning's keynote with uh, Nadine Burke Harris, uh, the point was driven home really well. And, and she's a rock star in this field. And certainly I wouldn't have anything to add to what she said, except that we're finally getting a handle on understanding how important it is that we look at trauma when we look at why people are in certain, certain circumstances. So if I look at it from the perspective of homelessness. Trauma precedes and accompanies homelessness. What I mean by the precedes part is in my work with homeless families and my work uh, visiting the homeless camps. And I'm, I'm going to show, I'm going to actually show you a little bit of uh, some of the interviews I've done with people in, in some of these homeless camps. Everyone's got a trauma story. Everyone who winds up out there uh, living unsheltered or living without their own place there's, there's some significant trauma in that uh, person's background. And 
if you somehow manage to become homeless without trauma, <laughs> which I haven't found that person yet, but being homeless is a, is a traumatic experience. We know that, for instance, there is no greater predictor of future homelessness than being brought up in a home that experienced homelessness, in a family that experienced homelessness when you were a child. That's one of the greatest predictors. I'm also fond of telling people that poverty charges interest. And so if we start out with a little bit of poverty or a little bit of trauma and it doesn't get fixed, it grows and it grows. Um, you know, to relate that to say a medical issue, you and I, or most of the people who are watching this or who you've seen today, if we get a toothache, we, we call the dentist, we know what to do. We go and we get that tooth looked at, maybe it needs a filling or something like that. We get on top of it early enough, the problem is taken care of, we don't even think about it. But if I can't afford the dentist, then I don't go to the dentist. And then my little cavity grows into a much bigger problem. Maybe I need a root canal, I don't get the root canal and then the decay continues. And I might lose a whole bunch of teeth. It could even inf infect my jaw, then I can't eat. I could even get an infection so bad that it could spread to other parts of my body and kill me. That's just one example of the interest that poverty charges. And the same thing with the, the interest that trauma charges. If, if we're not on top of it, the effects of that trauma affect every interaction that we have afterwards, and it continues to be part of who we are and how we respond to this. So this is why we find such concentrations like these other numbers here. 93% of homeless moms have experienced trauma and 81% of them have experienced multiple traumatic events. Why is this important? Because we know, for instance, uh, foster youth. When uh, a girl ages out of foster care, a young woman, we would say, by the time she's 18 or 20, depending on the circumstances, you, know, you can stay longer uh, now. But if you age out of foster care, if you haven't been placed and you don't go back to where you came from, 60% of those women within 18 months will be either homeless incarcerated or dead. And two thirds of women who age out of foster care are pregnant within two years. Well, what does that do? That pretty much guarantees that the cycle of poverty is going to continue to the next generation. We know that 60%, 60 to 70% of homeless moms have experienced domestic violence. Well, if they're, again, a lot of families that I deal with, if it's a single mom and two or three kids who finally left that domestic violence situation, we know that the kids have been exposed to that. And if we're familiar with ACEs, we know that that's a very significant ACE in that child's uh, history. We also know that these things continue. They have long lasting effects on your housing, your stability, your housing stability, your mental and physical, emotional, spiritual, and financial well being. These things are not easy to get over. People don't just pull themselves up by the bootstraps and get over it. This stays with you for the rest of your life if you don't get the right kind of interventions. Again, what was really encouraging to listen to Dr. Harris talk this morning is that um, given the simplest of treatments, which is just to be in a loving, kind environment, great changes can be made and progress for the person who suffered that trauma. And when you talk about children, as she did again this morning. And you can find so much data and there, there's some variations, but all of it looks similar to this. Kids who don't have their own place to live get sick at, at twice or even more the rate of other children. So that means they're missing more school. They often go hungry uh, way more than other kids do. Here it says twice as much, I, I, depending on your neighborhood. Um, some kids, the only place they eat is at school. So then if they miss going to school, because they're sick, they also miss that food that they don't get at school. They also have twice the rate of learning disabilities as non-homeless kids, twice as likely to repeat a grade. Again, charging interest, the interest of trauma, the interest of poverty is keeps piling up. We also know that these kids are way more likely to be suspended, expelled, have any kind of discipline, uh, action, homeless, foster, and other kids who are from underserved populations have much greater rates of that. And then it continues on. That's what we call the school to prison pipeline, obviously. These kids also have a lot more interaction with law enforcement. They're a lot more likely to be adjudicated. They're a lot more likely to spend time behind bars before they get to school or before they get out of school. And we know these things 
uh, add up to a higher dropout rate. And again, you're, you're back into the interest that's being charged by poverty. You're going to wind up uh, on the course that you are, unless something changes it. And that course has some pretty obvious ends for most people. It's poverty, incarceration, um, unwanted pregnancies, and some pretty dangerous behaviors. And as we know from the ACE study, up to 20 years of your life. Um, it, your, your life is shortened by up to 20 years once you get past six of these adverse childhood experiences. So Resiliency Village Project is based in Tuolumne County, although I look forward to the day when we can expand that over on this side of the river. To make my case to um, county and city officials about how serious the homeless problem is in Tuolumne County, I ran these numbers. The seven numbers that you see at the top, these are the seven highest rates of homelessness in the country. Some of them are by county, some of them are by city. But New York City has the highest homeless population at 78,000 you know, plus, and also has um, the highest percentage per capita of homeless people are one of the highest if you look at it there. So um, I think it is the highest. And that's a lot of people. And so that's where all the attention goes is to someplace like New York, someplace like Los Angeles. We hear a lot about San Francisco because they have really high aggregate numbers. But if you look down at the bottom, we have Tuolumne County and the number 385 is the um, pit count from uh, 2019. So PIT stands for point in time count, and that's usually done in December or January. And if you're not familiar with it, um, people are sent out to find folks who are living unsheltered. So they have to either be living outdoors, living in a shelter, or in a transitional shelter. So if you manage to find a hotel room for one night or crash on somebody's couch for that night, you wouldn't be counted. So you're given a specific day, you know, January 21st. Where did you sleep on January 21st? And you can start asking that question the day before, like where are you gonna sleep tomorrow night? And you can ask it on that day and then for a couple few days after, but all of the uh, data is from one particular night. And you see that, in that count, we found 385 people in Tuolumne County. Well, in a population of 54,000 people, if you look at that per capita, that's right up there with some of these huge uh, in, you know, city places or urban counties that people pay attention to and notice and say, wow, they have a big homeless problem there. If you take the summer of 2017 pit count, where 711 people were found, it's easier to find people in the summer. And it's uh, you know, not quite double the number, but a significant increase in the number of unsheltered people. Again, these can't be doubled up in anyone, anyone's home. They can't be in a, in a uh, temporary situation like a hotel. That number is now greater per capita than New York City. And that's a significant number. And I'm pretty convinced that that number is way low because I just turned in the data for the um, Tuolumne County uh, Office of the Superintendent's Office. And we had 360 homeless children identified in grades uh, TK through 12. So if you add at least one parent to every one of those people, that's another 700 and some odd people. I figure every night in Tuolumne County, about 1,500 people do not have a place of their own to, to sleep. And you could do that kind of calculation for any of these foothill counties, and I'm pretty sure it'll be close to the same. So we see it's a really high rate. It's a high per capita number of people who are unsheltered. And again, there's a lot of focus. Uh, I, I took these pictures. I was in Los Angeles for a conference on trauma, actually, a couple of years ago, and we could still do those things, the ECHO Trauma Conference. Probably some of you have been there. I, I know a few who I've seen here today were. And yeah, that's what the streets look like in some parts of Los Angeles, but this is what rural homelessness looks like over here on the right. This is right outside uh, Sonora. And uh, this picture on the left, 
That's the homeless help desk. That's on the back side of City Hall in Los Angeles. And you see there's a homeless person sleeping on the porch of the homeless help desk. And that man is just walking by like there's nothing to it because there's people all up and down that street sleeping on that street. And people are sleeping in places like this on your right. That's what it looks like in the foothills. There's someone actually sleeps in that little structure on the left and in the bigger structure on the right. So what kind of impact does this have? to have this many homeless people? Well, certainly it's, it's a safety issue. The people who live out there, they're not safe. There's two people have been hit on the highway on, uh, or on Stockton Road, which is where one of the largest homeless camps have been hit by cars. One of them died. Um, just that kind of safety. It's also unsafe from a sanitary uh, perspective vermin, all that kind of thing, when you have people living in conditions like this, it's an impact that way. And the people who live outdoors like this are in constant fear of being robbed or being told to move. The level of anxiety that they live with would certainly uh, qualify as a behavioral health issue, just from what it's like to be out there, that level of unsafeness. And what I have to remind people of when we talk about you know, where are we going to put a, a, a homeless shelter or where are we going to put these folks to get them off the street? And there's a, you know, a fair amount of NIMBY and people are worried about crime. But I like to remind people that a homeless person is far more likely to be a victim of crime than they are to be the perpetrator. Over and over again, they are victimized, they are stolen from, they are um, sometimes beaten just for being homeless. I know a man in Sonora who was just, he had his head down in a garbage can pulling out some aluminum cans. Some young men, probably like, you know, around 18, 19 years old, asked him, are you homeless? He said, yes. He didn't even lift his head out of the garbage can and someone hit him in the head with a baseball bat. He was metaflighted to Modesto. He's still homeless in Sonora. Uh, and that was a significant brain injury to him. So it's, it's not safe to be someone who lives like this. The impact in our schools, I can tell you from uh, more than 16 years as a homeless education liaison, it's a lot harder to educate homeless kids. They have so much uncertainty and anxiety. They have, um, they're on the outside. They don't have the things that other kids have. They don't have the school supplies. They don't have the clothing. They don't get the food. If they're not taken care of at school, they're not sure what's going to happen. Um, asking traumatized homeless kids to behave like other children in school, it's kind of like asking them to play chess in the eye of a hurricane. Their whole world is spinning around them all the time, and we ask them to just behave like other kids. So just in the terms of a cost, we know that it costs us a lot more to educate those kids. They're worth every penny of it. But if we were on the other side of this, if these kids were taken care of, if this was front-loaded, if they didn't have to experience that, there would be a savings and there would be uh, more that could go into education in other ways. Obviously, businesses and merchants in, in Sonora, this is a really big issue because of the close proximity to downtown. Merchants don't like to see people sleeping in their doorways, and, and who doesn't understand that? They certainly don't like you defecating on the sidewalk or using the backside of the building as a latrine. Um, totally understandable. But where it gets to be problematic is when people are upset and angry and blaming um, homeless people for the situation that they're in. Uh, we need to work together to come up with a solution because what we've done so far hasn't worked and complaining about it isn't gonna change a thing. Talk to anybody in law enforcement and you'll find out they spend a lot of time dealing with, talking to, uh, responding to um, issues that have to do with people who are unsheltered. For service providers, if you work in say behavioral health or if you work in uh, Department of Social Services, you probably, won't have to sit down and think for long and remember how many missed appointments, how much time has been set aside for people who don't show up, how uh, often it is that people who are in the most difficult situations have the hardest time following through. And so the case plan never is actualized. We never get to where we wanna get with folks because they just can't uh, get there. And this, this costs us all. We, we're working over and over again on something that doesn't get taken care of. Same thing with hospitals, clinics, other medical providers. Uh, unsheltered people visit the emergency room more often than they should, um, which is the highest place 
the highest cost place to get care. And then little things that you or I or someone with a comfortable place to rest and, and take care of themselves get over, people out there do not get over. And colds become pneumonia and pneumonia becomes a hospitalization and other forms of neglect and failure to be able to care for yourself medically just add up and they cost more and more and more. Uh, not only in terms of what we pay, obviously, because they're on Medi-Cal or, or they're going to have to um, be written off by the hospital, but also in terms of just the amount of time that we have to invest in people who, again, their circumstances are charging them interest and they're not being able to get over simple health things that we could get over. So it costs us there. And then the last one to me is, is perhaps the greatest impact and the greatest cost and that's our loss of human potential. I've met people out in these homeless camps who had PhDs, doctorates, who can speak four and five languages, who have incredible skills, everything from amazing woodworkers to mechanics to former college professors. And when you get out here and you wind up without a place to live, it's really hard to come back from that and the spiral takes in the other direction. And there's just an enormous loss of human potential. And what about the, the kids who've been this way their entire life, never even scratched their potential? To me, that's, that's one of our greatest losses and the greatest impact of not addressing this. So, Mark, we, sorry, Mark, we have a quick question. Just okay, so this is where I was just gonna ask for questions before I play a video, so great. Yay, um, the question comes from Heather. Does your county have an outreach team? I'm in Stanislaus County and I'm part of an outreach and engagement team. So I was just curious. Yes, uh, I'm part of, I work with uh, a few folks at the county and at the County Office of Education. And since, um, let's see, I think it was in March or, yeah, yeah, it was in late February. Uh, Tuolumne County hired the first homeless prevention coordinator, and she's worked to uh, put together a, a few different subcommittees, and one of those subcommittees is outreach. But for years, there's been uh, groups of us that have informally gone out and done that kind of thing. Uh, I was a pretty active homeless education liaison, and I, that's how I came to have these videos and have that kind of contact with people. And then a month and a half ago, I took a, a team of a few folks from uh, public health out to one of the larger camps and we did we spent a few hours COVID testing and tested a whole bunch of uh, folks in the camps for uh, COVID-19. Uh, out of all of our tests, no one came back positive, but so we do we do spend some time with that. Uh, finally though, what organizations are part of the team? Uh, that coalition has um, all of the different heads of the uh, social service department, so um, Everybody who works in social services, one of the department heads is, uh, goes to some of the meetings. Probably what would be more, uh, give you a better feel for it is if I can remember some of the subcommittees. We have a youth and families subcommittee. We have a seniors subcommittee. We have a veterans subcommittee, a subcommittee that works on uh, transportation and food, uh, specific or a specific education subcommittee and a specific outreach committee. And each one of those is made up of people. And then there's a leadership committee. And so on all of those subcommittees, we have people from faith-based organizations, nonprofit um, service providers, and a few local businessmen have even agreed to participate and the County Office of Education. And I'm sure I'm missing a couple, but it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big group, especially for how young it is. Any other questions? She was following up just to say, are those committees boots on the ground as well? Yes, they are. In the early stages. So we've had a few meetings, but people have actually gone out, gone to the camps and are developing plans for how those groups can work together. And then the last one so far is, she says, that's great to hear. Um, one, there's a question, can we donate clothes to the homeless? And I'm wondering if maybe that could come up later. I'll actually talk a little bit about that. Let me write that down so I don't forget it. Of course, everything is different now in COVID. 
but I don't know if COVID hangs out in clothing. So we have been, um, that's part of what we've been doing with Resiliency Village is making regular visits to these camps to bring food, clothing, and other kinds of support, you know, like the medicine and stuff like that. So I'm gonna have, I think Eli controls whether or not these videos play, right? Yes. Okay, here's a couple of, these are all just like, just a couple minutes edited video. You may have to turn your sound up because that's one thing is it, the sound is a little bit low, uh, but this is just to kind of give people an idea. Who lives out there? What, what is it like to live in a, in a homeless camp, especially for a, for a while? Oops. Be here. Um, I was born here and I grew up in Washington when well, my brother was murdered in Washington. Oh. So we came out here to bury him and this is where I want to be is by my brother. So like there's no there's no one out there really that, that will hire us. I mean mm -hmm. I've tried. Mm -hmm. I I do side jobs. Is that hard for you? Uh yeah. Yeah. I've been on my own since I was fifteen. Since you were fifteen. I left home. Uh -huh. Because of family issues. Uh, was there a lot of like trauma or violence or anything uh, in your house? Violence and, um, a lot of physical and emotional abuse and and no one would listen. No one, when I went to CPS, they they just said I was I was lying. I was making the stories up. Get you without shelter. Um, I I once had my head on my shoulders and I had. I had a vehicle, I had my own home, um, and finances got real bad, and it was just hard to keep up with them, and I had, um, I was trying to fight to get my kids through CWS, and I had lost my case, and uh, that kind of just made me fall apart, and I went downhill. I couldn't keep up with my rent, and that's what kind of pushed me out towards here. How long have you been out here? Uh, now about a year and a couple of months. And how'd you come to be without shelter? Uh, I moved uh, from Oregon back to here and uh, uh, the people that I was living with moved to Nevada and uh, I had nowhere else to go except camping out right now. Um, I left in order to get my hep C clear because it got off drugs. I don't do no drugs, I don't do alcohol, I don't do none of that stuff. But I'm doing my best. Right on. So what's you know, and, uh, But we do our best. Right on. Right on. You know, I worked hard and I got me a generator, no gas for it yet, but I do have a generator and a stove. I lost my, uh, a lot of my memory. Um, I don't remember going to high school. I don't remember going to college. I wrestled with Fresno State Bulldogs, crying out loud. I don't remember it. You know, so I'm out here doing the best I can, hoping I can find that one person that could just take me aside. Uh, well, before that, I broke my neck and my back and yeah. coming down in a trucking accident, coming down Grants Pass, and I was living in Stockton, uh, collecting workman's comp and taking care of my wife and my mama. And they both, they both died in the same month. My mom died right on top of me. I mean, my, my wife died right on top of me, Janela the J non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was petting her, she uh, passed away. And, and that messed me up. So mm -hmm. I, uh, and, uh, I walked. Yeah. Coming back, I'm back now. I'm good now, pretty much. You know, I use it as fuel. I walked away from three cars, uh, 20,000 bucks in woodworking tools. I was a skilled woodworker. I mean, I am. So, well, stop right there. So when you look at the stories of these folks, uh, Michael here, who we first heard, I, I, it's hard not to notice the change in his expression and how he looks when I ask him if there was trauma in his life. And then the same thing with Lynette, who speaks afterwards, and she talks about losing her kids in the CWS case. Again, we just see already her young children are uh, victims of trauma, 
who knows what all happened to their family, but they're already not with their mom. They're already in that, you know, uh, pipeline of this extra form of suffering that, that this population lives with. And same with Tuck, uh, same with, and uh, all of these folks are still out there. And these videos are from two years ago. So with all of this combined, a couple of years ago, um, I got this idea that uh, we needed to take this idea of trauma-informed care directly to service of homeless folks, of people who are living without shelter. And um, I was fortunate, one of my past bosses, a superintendent, Dr. Brenda Chapman, uh, she retired a couple of years before me. And she uh, called me up one day and said, you know, I'm, I've had enough break. Uh, I want to get back into something. Can I work with you on a trauma project? And I said, you know what, I, I've got this idea. <laughs> and uh, she was just crazy enough. To, it's sort of nice when you can work with, with one of your old bosses, you know, that you really had a good working partnership. And, and I really am blessed to work with Dr. Chapman. And then Shelly Muniz, who is a librarian at uh, Columbia College and is also a, a, an author. And we wound up writing a, a book together and then um, decided we'd work on this project. And that's where Resiliency Village was born. So I just want to <laughs> this uh, graphic right here, we had, uh, you know, all three of us are boomers. And we had sort of put this idea on paper and kind of drew a little sketch of it. And we showed it to a young person. And he goes, you guys, your graphics suck. Let, let me fix this for you. So he came up with this uh, diagram that you see here, almost looks like, a little bit like a mandala. And the idea of Resiliency Village is that trauma healing will be at the center of our approach to dealing with folks who don't have a place to sleep. And that includes a whole bunch of ways to deal with that trauma, but I'll run down the things on the left first. And you can kind of gaze at this one over here, but we are working, and I can tell you now, I can tell you today, I wasn't sure if I'd be able to, but we are in escrow on a 40 acre uh, horse ranch, which we're really excited about. It has housing on it. It's already housing three um, elderly veterans who um, are gonna stay with us. And, has all the potential to do what we would like to do, even though it's not our first choice or second or even third choice of land. We ran into NIMBY issues, we ran into landlord issues, seller issues. We had one seller who, when he looked at what we were wanted to do with the project, he said, absolutely not. I, from what I understand, what I was told later, it was against the law for him to discriminate against us that way, but uh, he, he wouldn't even sell us the property if he knew that we, once he found out what we wanted to do with it. So housing first and low barrier housing. If you're not familiar, that means that we will take people wherever they are and they can come into the emergency shelter. You don't have to be sober. You don't have to be clean from drugs. Uh, you don't have to pass a background check. Uh, the best practice right now is that we get you in, we get you into some place where you feel safe that you can sleep. Then our trauma-centered holistic services you don't even have to participate in those in it while you're in the emergency shelter. Now, another unique approach to this is we're going to do three phases of shelter all at one place. That includes the emergency shelter. And the goal is from the minute you walk into the emergency shelter is what's your exit plan? Where are we gonna move you to? Uh, for some people, if it's just episodic homelessness, just something, they, a bump in the road, our, our program will be get you back out and get you into your own home as quickly as possible. For other folks, they may have to stay with us for a while. So we're all also going to offer transitional housing. So you move out of the emergency shelter and move into a tiny home or some other appropriate shelter for you to stay a little bit longer. And then we will also have a third form of housing, which would be long-term uh, extended care, because we do know some people who they're not going to ever get physically or mentally well enough to be able to go out and live on their own. So we're going to provide all three of those kinds of housings. So the idea is to uh, understand that we're working with people who have this kind of injury. And instead of requiring you to sit down and talk to a counselor about the time your dad beat you up or the time that your uncle raped you or the time that your parents uh, had a huge fight in the house and sort of relive it, 
Um, what we've seen in some of the places that we visited and what we've seen in the work that we've done so far is giving people the chance to actually do something like write a story, write a poem, do a, a spoken word piece, write a piece of music, maybe put together a play, maybe do some art, record something, create a podcast, work in a garden, work with animals, ways to work these things out that heal you. Because for a lot of people, sit down and talk therapy just doesn't do it. So that's why you see all these different possibilities around that. This is not an actual layout for the piece of property. It's just the idea of how it will work. Starting with everything starts with the idea that we're going to address your trauma, even if it's just in the way that we talk to you and the way our staff interacts with you and the way we interact with each other as staff and how we um, run the organization. It's all based on... Uh, practices that are meant to help heal trauma. So uh, we talked about it before, community partnerships. We have got tremendous support so far from the Tuolumne County, from other nonprofits, from faith-based organizations, from the schools, from um, pretty much everyone we've reached out to, other than sometimes neighbors or people who are just really, <laughs> of all the places, we had one potential neighbor at another site we were looking at that was a very conservative church. And when we met with the group, the pastor told me um, I was making a mistake. And what I really needed to do was read a book called The Tragedy of American Compassion, because it would enlighten me to the fact that what I was doing was just enabling people to stay in this uh, life of misery. So we had quite a discussion that day. They, they wound up leaving feeling better than what they did when they came, but I realized what we we're up against in terms of people's opposition. Some people literally think it's a bad idea to help those who are less fortunate. And those are the kind of things that you gotta work around, but you can't, um, you can't discount the power of community partnerships. Without them, we're convinced this won't happen. Peer mentoring, if you're someone who's come into the program, stay with us for a while, we're going to hope and expect and train you to be able to help the next person who comes in behind you. You'll be paying it forward that way. We want everyone who lives there to be able to coach and help the people who come in after them. Um, restoring the dignity of work. There is no question in my mind that there are very, very, very few people who quote unquote want to be homeless or who have chosen that lifestyle. Every single person, including the ones that I talked to in the videos that you saw and many more who I didn't include their videos, Everyone wants a job. Everyone wants some way to exchange with the outside world um, in a way, a meaningful way, and earn their keep. I, I really, um, of all the things that people say that get under my skin when they talk about homeless and unsheltered people, it's this concept or this idea that people want to be there. They absolutely do not. They just need some help. Uh, so we want to foster post-traumatic growth in self-reliance. You're all familiar with the term post-traumatic stress disorder, but there's also something called post-traumatic growth, and that's the ability to take what, what has happened to you and use it in a constructive way. Maybe you tell people about your past so that they don't have to repeat it. Maybe you're one of those people who you this idea of a chip on your shoulder. People told me I couldn't do something, so I'm going to prove them wrong. Or some people just say, Everything that I went through was a humbling experience. And now that I've been able to get wherever I am, I'm never going to forget where I came from and help other people. However it works for you, post-traumatic growth is what we're trying to foster. We'll also make these services available to non-residents because some of the strongest pushback that we get, and that's not the only reason to do it, but some of the strongest pushback that we get are from people who are living just above the margin just barely making it, really struggling. Their rent and everything like that is always down to the bone. And they look at programs like this and say, you're going to give free housing to drug addicts and people who can't take care of their kids. And I'm out here working my butt off and I don't get anything. And we found that by offering people services, uh, our food bank just exploded during the uh, pandemic. And we were seeing more and more working people and folks who would normally not come. And again, by treating them with dignity, by treating them with a trauma-informed approach, we found that they were more willing to help us after they got back on their feet. And then lastly, we really want to be transparent and accountable to the community and to the people who come there. Uh, if you've been working in this for a while, you've probably heard the saying, nothing about us without us. 
So um, the long-term goal for this is that we are just the caretakers and stewards from a distance and that that becomes a self-governing community that only just has to look for, to us you know, for advice or for questions or, or things like that. But at some point, people who live there or have lived there are the ones who are really gonna be running the show. And that's, that's the long-term goal as we, as we go on. Are there any questions about this part? Because this is, the, this is the real meat of what Resiliency Village is all about. Well, you're getting a lot of wows. You know, this is gave me the chills. Heather is really excited. And she had a couple of questions. One is, does your organization house folks from out of county? We haven't housed anyone yet uh, on site. We were in another office and all we did was pay for hotel vouchers. And it's really rare that, that someone would come direct from another county. We never had that happen, but we did have some people who were stuck here or there and that we helped them before they were able to go back to where they came from or something like that. And that's a question that we get a lot because people are concerned about somehow uh, putting good services out and that it will track people from other places. Um, in my experience, it's very difficult to move. And especially during the uh, pandemic, if, if you don't have any money. Um, so I haven't seen that, but if someone from somewhere else showed up and uh, we had the space for them, we're not gonna turn them away because they're not from Tuolumne County. And her other, her next question was, will there be a youth focused shelter anywhere in this design? Yes, um, I didn't, I guess I should add that to here. Um, having come from the position of working with unsheltered youth a lot, especially unaccompanied homeless minors, youth, there will be a youth component in both of the uh, emergency shelter and transitional shelter component. We're not going to have long-term uh, unaccompanied minors. And that's a, a, a big part of what we're working through right now in terms of the licensing and everything to be able to um, legally house underage um, homeless folks. But I can tell you that that's one of the, um, the greatest needs, uh, especially as they get older in, into high school. They are better and better at hiding better and better at not staying with their parents and uh, better and better at not letting anybody else know what they're going through. So that'd be key to our outreach and to uh, every part of this is to make sure that we have space for the youth. Uh, along that same lines, are you primarily focused on individuals or will you be providing support for families too? That's from Amy. Families are probably, that's who I've seen the most Again, because I come from uh, working in the uh, school arena, and so we will be very much geared towards families, but we'll also be serving individuals because it's hard for, I mean, like, for instance, Sonora has one homeless shelter, and it's a high barrier shelter. You have to drug test, background check, and a single male can almost never find a bed in that shelter. It's almost always... Um, women and women with children, or sometimes a whole family, a man and a wife and their, and their kids. So fortunately for us, it's a big enough space that we'll be able to accommodate uh, some of all of these groups that really need to help. And this question has already come up twice since you really started talking. How is this being funded? <laughs> with a lot of hustle. I've never raised this kind of money in my life. Um, we've been awarded a couple pretty good grants. We got a significant contribution from one of our uh, tribes over there, the Chicken Ranch Casino or Chicken Ranch Miwa Tribe, which operates the casino, gave us a $150,000 grant and a couple of their individual members gave us some pretty large grants. We've been awarded money from the Continuum of Care and from the Sonora Area Foundation, lots of private donors, but it's a, it's a big struggle. It, it, that will be our biggest challenge, no question about it. Okay, you're getting a lot of input from Heather who would like to connect with you outside of this presentation. So I'm asking for her contact information for you. Great, I would like to connect with Heather. 
And it's 2.06, just as a heads up. So I'm going to let you okay. go back. All right. Okay. I always, uh, in, in all my work with this, and especially in these last few years of putting this program together, I look at what we're proposing to do, and I ask myself, would Leon be successful here? These are two pictures of Leon. Leon is my brother. And the picture on the right was the last time I saw him. It was uh, three days before he died. And my brother, unbeknownst to us, and I mean, we, we knew that he had behavioral health issues, mental health issues, but he also had some significant trauma in, injuries that we didn't even know about until years later. And he wound up homeless for most of his life and constantly struggling with it. And I would, you know, I've had him live at my house, but you can't have someone who has the dual diagnosis and all of these issues going on living at your house unless you're gonna give up everything you, that you do and stay and be with that person at all times because um, they're fine. Leon would be fine as long as I was there, as long as we were together, I, I could keep him on the straight and narrow or help him support him in that. But if I was gone, He'd say, I'm feeling pretty good. I could go have one drink and then that would, you know, it would slide downhill. I'd come home and I don't know, there'd be a fire in the backyard or I, I, yeah. Anyhow, what Leon told me that day there on the right, as we had our last meal together is, uh, Mark, I'm never alone. Pain is always with me. And the places where Lee could be okay we're in some kind of community. And that's why we're taking this community approach to Resiliency Village. Everybody starts out like Leon on the left. Everyone's a beautiful child, but something happens. And then they wind up like Leon on the right. And what we're working to do is hopefully connect with Leon the child and Leon, the child's mom, whoops, before Leon uh, dies at age 52 from acute alcoholism and the really rough life of living outdoors. I can't even count the number of times he's been assaulted, arrested, mistreated. Even there, you can see the, the cut above his eye. Um, his jaw is broken. His teeth were never repaired. At this point, uh, his liver was bulging out of his ribs. That's why he's wearing that big, heavy jacket. Uh, he, he had so many injuries, so many uh, adventure, misadventures. Uh, and I always thought, well, if I can figure out, if we can figure out a place where he could thrive, where he could be happy, I think it'll work for anyone. And that, that's what we're working with, uh, with Resiliency Village. And one of the places that is inspirational to me is New Orleans. You know, they had an amazing, tremendous homeless problem after Hurricane Katrina. And they uh, were able to virtually eliminate chronic homelessness with a tiny village approach, with a housing first, low barrier approach. And this Martha Cagle, uh, who's uh, the director of the Union, Unity of Greater New Orleans, this, this says it all for me that we have to provide housing with people who have disabilities, for the elderly, we have to make sure the children are homeless. That's part of a healthy community in a country that has a moral core. And I, I do believe we have that moral core. Sometimes it gets crowded up and, and lost in the grand scheme of things. But I think if we return to our moral core, we will realize that we are all better off when we help those people who are vulnerable and especially the ones who haven't been able to help themselves. So any other questions? So we haven't gotten other questions right now, but I needed to ask Eli, after this presentation, will Mark be able to look still at what's in the question and answer things? Because there's a few sort of personal messages that I'm not sure it's appropriate for me to read out loud. Can Mark look at them later? Is Eli nodding? I believe so. He's saying he believes so. <laughs> okay, I'll try to leave it up so that we can do it. Sure, or maybe you can screenshot them or Okay, or people who are sending personal messages, if Mark doesn't reply, it's because this disappeared at the end of 
the session. But you're getting a lot of thank you, love this great model, gives me the chills. Um, lots of really grateful feedback for the work you're doing and for your vision and your presentation. Uh, the final one is, is there an email or link for donations to your project? Yes, you can go to resiliencyvillage.org and there you will see we do have a virtual fundraiser coming up and we have a few things like um, an online auction that's up all the time and uh, option, you can learn a lot more about the project and you can also donate there. So resiliencyvillage.org. <laughs> we never thought about this when we came up with the name, but it's really hard to spell resiliency for, for a lot of people. <laughs> I, I still have to go back from time to time. So if you don't get it right the first time, check your spelling and resiliency. And if, 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 <laughs> and if you want a little bit more of this or uh, um, at our virtual fundraiser, Patch Adams is going to be our keynote speaker. He was going to come for a big fundraising event in March, right before the pandemic hit. He was going to come and visit us in Sonora. If you don't know Patch Adams, you probably saw the Robin Williams movie, Patch Adams. But Patch Adams is an amazing humanitarian healer and uh, activist who um, he really gets it in terms of trauma-informed care. 